Hello, I'm Terry Georgia from the London Psychology Collective. Today we have with us Professor Amy van Dersen, who is one of the UK's most well-known figures in the field of existential psychotherapy. Amy is a psychotherapist, a philosopher, a psychologist, and a university professor. She is also the author of many books on existential psychotherapy. Welcome, Emmy. Thank you. <laughs> so, Emmy, would you like to tell us about your current position and, and your current work? Sure, sure. I spend most of my time at the New School of Psychotherapy and Counselling, where I am the principal, and that means doing a lot of work with the staff, with the students, um, so lots of layers to my work, lots of administration, lots of academic work, lots of development work, mm -hmm. and also research and teaching and supervising, so very, very busy. Yeah. We have about 300 students and we specialize in existential therapy. Mm -hmm. So we run doctoral programs um, in existential psychotherapy and counseling, existential counseling psychology, existential coaching. And alongside that, we run our private practice, which is called Dilemma Consultancy, where we see our own clients, supervisees, couples, groups sometimes. And we also run a low-cost counselling service, which is staffed by our doctoral students who I supervise. And in addition to that, we run the Existential Academy, which is an enterprise to make existential ideas available to ordinary people, rather than only those who train, and to help them to use those principles in their daily life. Mm -hmm. I also still run a private practice in Sheffield, but I'll be closing that down because mm. the London side of things has just taken over and grown and grown mm. and we, we really need to be rational about this and not overdo it. Okay. And so can you tell us about, for those people that don't know, what existential therapy is uh, according to you? Yes. So existential therapy is a philosophical method. It helps people to understand and ask questions about their lives in a way that they've never done before. And of course you do this in a dialogue, in a discussion where there is a kind of equality, where you really together look at a problem, really look at it carefully in a kind of Socratic way, get to the bottom of it, use phenomenology to get to the essence of it, so that what seemed very knotted and complicated begins to unravel, begins to come clear, so that people start to get a sense of perspective on their mm. lives again, and they get a sense of ownership. They get a, the feeling that they can be in charge of their lives, and they get in touch with what is the purpose of their particular existence. And once they get that, and once they become curious about life again, and curious about their own abilities again, that kind of loosens something up. They find their freedom again. They find their sense of wonder again. And their lives just change all by themselves. Hmm. So that's all we have to do. Yeah, just that. Yeah. And you mentioned their phenomenology. Yes. Can you tell us about that? Yes, yeah, so phenomenolog phenomenology is something that um, I learned about in France in the early 70s when I worked with a philosopher called Michel Henry, um, reading lots of Husserl and Heidegger and other people, but mainly concentrating on Husserl's work. I understood that phenomenology can provide us with a completely different method for doing evidence-based work. So instead of using the old scientific methods, phenomenology was intended to help people look very carefully at what is actually there in the world and look at it so carefully that we take away layer after layer of what we thought we knew, we set our assumptions into brackets and we start to describe what is really there in order to come to terms with it and see it anew. 
and we do this about the things in the world, about the process of our own thinking and our own observing, and also about what goes on in ourselves. So it does it about the objective world, the subjective world, and the processing, consciousness world. And when you do all of that carefully, things emerge that you wouldn't have seen normally mm -hmm. before. Mm. So it's a very powerful method, but it needs quite a lot of discipline, mm. and it takes quite a little while to learn it properly, mm. 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 but mm. very worthwhile. Mm. Much yeah. underestimated, even though these days it is very much at the foundation of most qualitative research. Mm. And so, if you take us back, yeah. it'd be interesting to hear how you became inspired, you know, by th these ideas and how you came yes. to enter the field. Yes. Well, that goes back a long way, really. That goes back all the way to my childhood. I was born some years after the end of the Second World War in The Hague, in the Netherlands. And the Netherlands had been pretty much destroyed by the Second World War. And a lot of people, including my own parents, had lived very difficult lives. So <clears throat> they had been um, through what was called in, in the Netherlands the hunger winter of 44, 45 during which all resources had been cut off to the west of the Netherlands, to Holland. And so um, they had no food. They had nothing to eat, so they survived on things like, horrible things like, eating um, tulip bulbs, uh, things they wouldn't have thought about eating before. And they were emaciated at the end of the war. Um, in and also um, houses had been bombed, so there was nowhere to live. My father, who was of an age where he should have been in the military service, was pursued by the Germans, and he, so he had to hide in a loft where he contracted double pneumonia. I mean, it was a terrible story of deprivation and suffering. And they were very much with that suffering all the time we grew up. <clears throat> so. This impacted on me greatly. I think I got quite a um, dark view of human existence and I believed that the world was quite a dangerous place. So some of the things that helped me with that were well, A is that was, I was a very curious child and I loved to sort of run around in nature and discover things. I was also a great reader and so I got a lot out of the books I read. My parents had gotten into um, exploring something called Theosophy, which was an exploration of all the world religions to try to distill out of that a sort of common denominator. And that was in the hope of finding some, something to believe in when everything they had grow, grown up with and believed in previously had been really wrecked and destroyed. So those kinds of explorations helped me to have a sort of vitality and a, a, a really strong sense that my life mattered and that I had to do something good with it, that I had to help to change the world for the better. So that is what drove mm. me. Yeah. But I also wanted to find out principles to live by of my own. And that's how I became interested in philosophy. Mm. I did a classical education and so I learned Greek and Latin and I read uh, Plato in Greek, well read, I you know translated it page by page and I became absolutely fascinated by the Socratic dialogues and really started to adore Socrates more or less and thought that he was absolutely brilliant and especially in the sense of him not being cowed by other people and always pursuing the search for truth. And I kind of committed my life to that, to the search for truth. Mm. And so I wanted to study philosophy and that's why I went to France to study philosophy there because um, studying philosophy in the Netherlands would have been very much like studying philosophy in the United Kingdom at that time, which is to do a lot of linguistic philosophy and not really doing much of that kind of philosophy I was interested in, classical philosophy, 
phenomenology, existentialism, those were the things I really wanted to come mm. to grips mm. with. And, yeah. and that's what I was able to do in, in Montpellier. Yeah. And you said in previous interviews that um, you were looking, as you're saying now, for searching for some kind of truth, for your mm. own answers mm. and to understand the mm. world. Mm. And also that um, it was helpful for you to explore religion or that you had an mm. awareness of other people's religions mm. and that there was this yes. change in your parents. Yes, that's, you. that's true. Yes, yes. Yes, I think I've always realised that, well, because I didn't grow up with a particular religion, I was kind of free from the start of you know, any religious beliefs. But I was acutely aware that it meant a lot to people that to have some faith in something that transcends human nature and that transcends the difficulties of existence mm. is, is really crucial for people to get through. And I became aware that some people had replaced spiritual beliefs with other kinds of beliefs. For instance, a belief in science as the ultimate principle, which really is a belief in nature or a belief in the uh, importance of figuring out how nature fits together. Now that's fine, I think that's a very valid belief because that's obviously something everybody can agree on and it's good to start from something that we can agree on and that we can investigate. But it's not enough because as soon as you get some facts together you need to make sense of those facts. So you need something beyond the investigation to actually make meaning out of the investigations and the results. I don't think that world religions have got that quite right because they were all created before the scientific revolution. So they're all in trouble. They're all in sort of contradiction with that scientific frame of mind. And so I think that philosophy is really the only place to go because philosophy does bring together investigation of facts, science, with the history of thought, with the capacity to think, for instance, with phenomenological methods, with heuristic methods, with other forms of hermeneutic methods, um, and provides us with a methodology as well as a kind of meta view of all those other things. Mm -hmm. So that's why I put my faith in philosophy. Right. And then Afterwards, you said you moved to France and yeah. you started to apply some of these philosophical ideas to people yeah. that were in psychological distress. Yes. Well, what happened was that when I finished my master's in philosophy, I got a post in a psychiatric hospital. I had already done placements in a psychiat psychiatric hospital in Montpellier, um, but then I got a full-time post as a psychologist in a hospital called saint Alban which was in the Lozère in France, in the Massif Central. And that was one of the most revolutionary hospitals in France, where they had taken down the walls of the mental hospital just after the end of the Second World War. And they had experimented with setting up um, very um, expansive um, ergotherapy. So they had lots and lots of workshops mm. where patients could work but they also had um, a film uh, society, they had a newspaper, they had an internal therapy department which was very well established where people did lots of group therapy every day and lots of individual therapy and tried out really lots of methods. They, were, um, they did training themselves there in psychodrama and in body-based therapies as well. So I learned a tremendous amount working there. Mm -hmm. I was married at the time to a French psychiatrist, which explains why I got sort of gradually into psychiatry. And that meant that we lived in the psychiatric hospital, right in the middle of it. And I used to kind of work 24 seven because I enjoyed it so much. I had a bunch of dogs and I could walk around uh, from ward to ward and to the social center and to all these therapy centers and we did all sorts of things with with people 
going out for big walks in the mountains, taking them skiing in the mountains, um, exploring all kinds of ideas in groups, um, doing uh, group therapy. I mean, it was endless, really. Mm. It was a time of great creativity, and I got really, really into it. Mm. Because what I discovered that although I had no psychotherapeutic training up to then, no psychology training up to then, although there was some psychology and psychoanalysis in my philosophy training, my philosophy training was not just sufficient to do that work, it helped me do that work. So I did the work in a sort of, you know, very personal way. I used to engage in philosophical discussions with people and very gradually out of that I developed a more systematic way of doing that. Mm. But of course started reading psychotherapy very avidly, you know, read my way through Freud, my way through Lacan and then realized that really I needed qualifications because when I wanted another job I couldn't <clears throat> get one unless I had those qualifications. So I went back to the university in Bordeaux this time, qualified as a clinical psychologist, whilst again working in another psychiatric hospital in Agen, and did there my training as really as a Lacanian psychotherapist, and then started to get quite disenchanted with all that, um, because <coughs> I was moving away from my philosophical ideas and had mm. to fit in with, you know, being a clinical psychologist, which in the 70s in France meant doing Rorschach tests, TAT tests, doing personality testing, and then maybe a little bit of psychotherapy, but not very much. So I was looking for a way out of that and met some people at a conference in Milan, in Italy, um, who were working in London with the anti-psychiatry movement, mm. which I prefer to call the radical psychiatry movement because they weren't really anti, but yes. you know, more radically trying out different ways of doing it. Went to visit them in London in 76, was invited to come over to work with them and moved all of my belongings, all of my life from the south of France to London in 1977 and to go live in a therapeutic community. Right, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. So, so, you, so you were then inspired to come to, to London because you'd heard about these therapeutic communities yeah. that were run by people like R.D. Lang. Who yes, famous, that's right. Yes, and of course I'd read all of Lang's books by then and also Joe Burke's books and Morty Schatzman's books. And it was the Arbors, rather than the PA, that mm. invited me to come work with them. The PA being the Philadelphia... The, sorry, the Philadelphia Association, mm. which was set up by R.D. Lang and some of his um, colleagues. Mm. But they split after a while, after the experiment at Kingsley Hall. There was a split in the organization. And out of the Philadelphia Association then also grew the Arbors Association set up by Joe Burke and Morty Schatzman and their wives. And they had set up also some therapeutic communities. And the good thing they had done is to set up a crisis center as well, because they had realized from their work at Kingsley Hall that when you try to work with psychotic people, mm. mostly schizophrenic people, mm. outside of the psychiatric system, mm -hmm. and you propose to them to explore their madness, Without medication, what you get is chaos. So these are people with um, quite severe mental health oh, yes. problems. People Extremely with delusions so. and paranoia and hallucinations, the whole yeah. range. Yes, who who have chosen to not go along the medical. You know what you were well, describing. The, they've the, been through that or usually through already. It. Yeah, and they choose to live in a therapeutic community, which That's is a correct. place without medication and without traditional structures yep. of psychiatry. That's right. right. That's right. So, so what was that like? To so do that? I lived in the therapeutic community in Norbury mm -hmm. for a year with um, eight to nine patients, but they weren't patients, they were residents. And that was the only home I had at that time. So I was there 24-7. And, you know, the task was not to put a white coat on and to be above them and to give them therapy. Mm -hmm. The task was to bring in my 
in our capacities for balance and for sorting out difficulties, but facing up the actual daily difficulties they were coping with. Yeah. And that was a huge challenge, even though I had been through all these situations in mental hospitals and was used to quite a lot of you know, difficulty and working with quite extreme situations. This was different because this was my life. This wasn't my job, this was really my life. Mm. And so I had to start again, really. I had to really dare to be myself rather than to be a therapist and to meet people at the depth of their experience and the depth of their soul and not give them therapeutic ideas or concepts or theoretical things to hold on to, but really work with their difficulties and their concepts. Mm. So, suddenly, all of my philosophical knowledge, instead of my clinical psychology knowledge, came to the fore, and not only was it possible to use it, it was absolutely necessary to use it. I also realized that, to my disappointment, in the Philadelphia Association and the Arbors Association, people had drifted away from the existential ideas. The Philadelphia Association was just discovering Lacan and Rieke and lots of other French philosophers and therapists who I had you know, been already through and had rejected in a way. And in the Arbors, they had become Neo-Kleinian, so all the training program was taken over by Neo-Kleinian ideas. Very disappointing and disenchanting, but also an opportunity, because I was immediately invited by Joe to start teaching philosophy and existential therapy on the Arbor's training program. And that was my challenge. Now, I wasn't just doing it myself, working with people. I had to formulate it. I had to teach it. Yeah. And so, there was nothing. So this was the first time that you had tried to translate these ideas to other people. That's to right. To teach an approach That's right. in existential therapy. Yes. And the only book that I found helpful was Mary Warnock's book on existentialism. Mm. And the other book was Existence by May and Ellen Berger and Angel, which was, you know, a classic book that I discovered that I hadn't known about in, in France, where there was some good information about, you know, what Rollo May had done, more information about Bean Swanger than I already knew. And this whole new introduction for me at that time of Dasein's analysis as well. So I greedily took all of this information in and developed my own approach to existential therapy. Mm -hmm. So could you tell us about your ideas of, because just following on from you know, the work yeah. at these, in these therapeutic communities where yeah. you, there was this blurring of a boundary between you and people that were residents. Yeah. And how that, I suppose, uses a very different idea of what it means to be psychologically disturbed. Yes. I suppose, you know, because I suppose yes. at the moment we have this idea of mental illness. Yes. And that was a very controversial topic at the time. I think it still it is. very much so, yes. And, and, you know, of course, working in mental hospitals, the idea of mental illness had not been so problematic to me. What was problematic is people injecting others with medications that basically took their oh, autonomy away and their humanity away. That was clear to me. Mm -hmm. But I still held the idea of psychopathology quite strongly in my mind. And it was the residents in that community who really put me to the test and really challenged me to think about that in a new and different way. And it was quite paradoxical because on the one hand it was clear that they weren't coping with life that they were drifting, that they were lost, that they were distressed, that they were living in constant anxiety, depression, panic, um, you know, you name it, everything. But on the other hand, they were very strong-minded people who were quite sure that they did not want to be patronized, or as I like to say, matronized, 
and they did not want to be treated as patients or clients, they constantly challenged me to have ordinary discussions with them and for me to be equal to them, to be the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that worked for me. Difficult at first, yeah. but after a few months I got the hang of that. And that really helped me develop this different way of working. So, so does this then translate into the kind of approach that you use mm, very in terms much of so. existential yeah. therapy? So yeah. this blurring of a, of a boundary? Of, of well, it's not blurring of the boundaries. It's being very clear about the boundary, yeah. which is that you know I'm still the therapist and mm. they're still the client who needs some service from mm. me. And I'm very serious about providing that service to the best of my ability. It also means there's a very clear boundary about being in role. In other words, I won't become their friend and I won't become uh, their family member or anything else. I will be their therapist. But I will put my own mind, heart and soul at their disposal to help them really directly address the issues in their lives and really make sense of the problems that they have failed to solve up to now. Mm. So I am quite directly available for that and I think people know that. They know that you're with them. That's not about showing empathy or you know anything therapeutic. It's about just being with the person and being really touched by their predicament and really genuine about the realization that their predicament today could be a, my predicament tomorrow or in 10 years or you know at some point in my life might have been my predicament mm -hmm. and that therefore humanly speaking it matters it's important it's real and i can't be so much in role that i forget to make it real and to make it matter so you've been a therapist for over 40 years, hmm? you've been doing clinical 42 work. Years. 42 yeah. years. Well, actually 44 if I count the two years of placement. Okay. Yeah. And in that time, is there anything you could offer us that would be helpful for us as, as people interested in the field and for people that are thinking of embarking hmm. on the field? Things that you've learned over, over this time being a therapist? Hmm. So many things. What, it's difficult to know, you know, what kinds of things would be helpful to you. I think the first thing is that you've got to follow your own curiosity and your own way of being yourself more than any theory or any dictates from other people. That I'm quite sure when you look at the research that what makes the difference is not one method or another method. What makes the difference is not one therapist to the other. What makes the difference is to what extent any therapist actually engages in a real way with a real client or a real patient. When there is that real engagement, something happens. And that is what is required. It's a very Buberian thing, you know, it's a sort of I-thou thing, where you really create a space and a presence and a connection. And when that happens, something changes in the world, you know. Two people's minds become connected, and the two of them together understand a lot more than one person on their own. And that's not just about knowing you're not alone, it's about actually seeing things in a different way, experiencing things in a different way, and having a kind of trust in humanity again, and in your own capacity to find meaning, to find purpose, to make something of your life, to not waste your life. It's those kinds of things that really make a difference. Mm. Yeah. And so over this time, you know, of being a therapist over these years, has your view changed at all of therapy? Yes, yeah. it has. Yes, yes, well, I must confess that when I started out as a greenhorn, I thought that I needed to absorb all of Freud and I needed to have my own analysis and I needed to do things by the book and I needed to, you know, tick all the boxes. And 
I very much believed that psychotherapy was a kind of doctrine that you had to master and that you had to make your own and that you have to apply in the correct way. Well, I think most experienced therapists go well beyond that. Whichever method they originally trained in, you know, the research shows mm -hmm. that experienced therapists work in very similar ways. And I, of course, like to think that's a very existential way, that as you mature and as you become more philosophical in your later years, you naturally become a more existential therapist because you realize that the real life issues and the real philosophical understanding of what goes wrong is where it's mm. at and that you can't be distant, that you have to get your hands dirty and you have to muck in and you have to be there with the other person. Yeah. Yeah. So I think probably the, the main question I haven't asked yet is what, what do you think motivates you to, to do this work and, and mm. what continues to, to, to excite mm. you and motivate you now? Mm. Well, that's a very hard question to answer because I'm really not sure about that. And it's, it's very multifold, I think. So clearly there is a motivation that comes from my childhood to go back to the psychoanalytic path, you know, which is that I grew up with seeing so much misery and so much hardship and being so aware of suffering that I have this great motivation to lessen suffering not just for other people, but for myself as well. And I think I feel a lot happier when I feel I'm doing something constructive and positive for other people. So it's a very personal, egocentric pursuit in that way. But that's not all there's to it. There's clearly something in my nature um, that, that makes me just very intrigued about life and very curious about it. And there is some philosophical kind of aspiration as well. I have this kind of incredible desire to know what truth is and to, you know, find out where I go wrong and what's, what I it can improve and what I can do better for myself. So it's at least those three things, but there's plenty more. But I'm not going to tell you everything about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, Emmy, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you Good. for joining us. Well, thank you very much for a stimulating exchange. Thank Thanks. You.